I'm a medical oncologist and I um, give treatment to patients who present with uh, kidney cancer early on, um, as well as uh, taking care of patients uh, where the cancer has spread. So here are my disclosures. I, probably the most important is I'm the study chair of one of the big trials that I'm discussing. Um, and I just wanted to define what I'm considering locally advanced kidney cancer because I think there's different definitions, but uh, what I'm really speaking about here are either kidney cancers that are based on their stage or, uh, or local spread are, are at risk for recurrence. Um, but in general, I'm talking about cancer that we're trying to remove completely and, and what can we do after that. And there's several ways that we try to determine, you know, when you have your kidney cancer removed, what's your risk for recurrence? And one of the uh, most important is, um, is basically your, your tumor stage. So that's based on the size of the cancer, whether you have any lymph node involvement, whether it's invading any of the um, structures within the kidney, like the, the, the collecting system where the urine drips out, or um, the blood vessels, whether, um, whether you have any metastases, um, whether the, the nucleus in the, in the actual cancer cell looks like it's actively dividing. But we also have prognostic nomograms, which uh, Dr. Abel referred to just uh, a few minutes ago, which are kind of using the stage, using the grade, but also using other things like whether there's dead tissue in the tumor, whether um, somebody isn't feeling well, whether their hemoglobin is low. And, and so people have developed these kind of statistical tools that, that we think in, in some cases might also give us a better indication than just stage alone. And so what's adjuvant therapy? So I, I like to say that it's treatment that we're giving to try to eradicate little bits of cancer cells that might still be present in the body, but that are too small to see on a scan. Um, you could also think about it, though, in, in terms of, uh, and, and I think we're broadening our diagnosis, there might even be people where you know for sure that you left disease behind, uh, the margins are positive, or um, you might see a little bit of disease that you can't uh, get to. But the ultimate goal, I think, should be that we want to cure disease in patients who ordinarily wouldn't be cured by surgery alone. So that's, that's what I think is the overarching goal of adjuvant therapy. And we use the drugs that we use in metastatic disease uh, commonly to, after they've been looked at in metastatic disease, we then look at them earlier and say, okay, it helped in metastatic disease is it gonna help in an earlier uh, situation? And so this, I uh, can't get the pointer to work, but this uh, um, is a, a, oh, there it goes. Um, there's really kind of three broad classes of drugs that we use in kidney cancer treatment. The most common are what we call the VEGF inhibitors. These are drugs that target blood vessels. There's the immunotherapy. I'm gonna show some more detailed slides. And then the mTOR agents, and, and they're sort of uh, grouped uh, by these different classes and stuff. And um, the, let's talk first about the anti-angiogenesis drugs. So kidney cancer in general is very vascular. There's lots of blood vessels. And in a lot of patients, there's a gene uh, that's located on the third chromosome called the von Hippel-Lindau gene that uh, is uh, dysregulated, it's turned off, and it kind of makes uh, uh, cancers form and, and cancers be more vascular. So uh, uh, the discovery of this uh, 20, 25 years ago led eventually to the development of drugs that would target blood vessels, target uh, the endothelial cells, the cells that line blood vessels. And this was really an incredible breakthrough. The first of these drugs got FDA approved in about 2004. And these are the majority of the pill therapies that you associate with treatment for kidney cancer. So um, you may know them by their commercial names. Uh, Sunitinib is uh, Sutent, uh, Bevacizumab is Avastin, 
pazopinib is votriant. There's also in Lyda. Uh, there's a lot of these drugs. But in the advanced disease stage, in metastatic disease, these drugs, these are curves showing the top curve means that um, there are more patients free of disease versus less patients. And so you can see that in each of these cases, these drugs really performed either better than um, a standard immune therapy, which was used uh, and, and is still around interferon, or whether uh, versus uh, a sugar pill. And, and roughly 80% of patients will benefit from these drugs if they have metastatic disease. Um, and so it, it really made sense to go back and look at these drugs and, uh, in, the, in the earlier settings. So these are drugs uh, in all three of these categories, but we're going to talk about the VEGF therapies first that showed a benefit um, or, or I shouldn't say um, have been tested for benefit or are undergoing uh, testing for benefit. And so far there have been seven trials conducted adjuvantly using these VEGF inhibitors or what we call an mTOR inhibitor. Everest is, is in here. Averolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. The rest of these are uh, vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors. And one of the ways that we look at whether a drug is active is we have to look at a time point that's close to the period of time that you're testing the drug. So we often use something called DFS, which is disease-free survival, or recurrence-free survival, which would be RFS. And you know this is, this is important to talk about because this is a really easy time point to mention. Um, so if you can show that you're delaying recurrence, maybe that means you're benefiting from the drug. But I would argue that overall survival is probably a pretty important endpoint. And when we get into the immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, later on uh, in, in what I'm talking about here, you'll see why there may be a, a really good rationale to look at the immunotherapy agents. So let's review the trials that have been completed recently. And uh, the trials that, uh, um, oh, I, you know, I, I, one of my, the slide down at the bottom is not going to show. So there's four trials that have been reported recently. One of them was the ASSURE trial, which I'm the, uh, study chair of. There was the PROTECT trial. There's S-TRAC. And down below this, uh, sorry about this with the slides, there's something called the ATLAS trial. So ASSURE was a trial that uh, looked at two drugs, uh, Sutent and Nexavar. And there were three groups of patients treated, um, or I should say three, three arms of the study. So this included some patients with smaller cancers, so cancers that uh, were a little bit smaller, but they had higher nuclear grade, and so there was some risk for recurrence, as well as larger cancers, including those that involved lymph nodes. We enrolled patients who had clear cell cancer, but we all also enlo uh, allowed a smaller population uh, that didn't have clear cell, that had papillary or chromophobe or you know some of the other kidney cancers. And everybody was treated for one year uh, and, and everybody had to take all of these pills. So in order for it to be a blinded study, they had to take pills that were labeled as Sutent, pills that were labeled as Nexavar, and pills that were labeled, uh, I mean, and some of them were placebo. So everybody took four pills of Sutent and um, four pills of, um, of Nexavar. So they were taking eight pills a day, and, and one group got all sugar pills, one group got Sutent with sugar pills of Nexavar, and the other group got sugar pills of Sutent with real Nexavar. So that's how we kept all of the doctors and all the patients sort of in the dark about what they were getting. And, and we can talk a little bit more about the use of placebo later, but um, virtually all of the trials that have been done with the VEGF inhibitors have used placebo. PROTECT did the same thing they used, um, but they allowed cancers that were bigger than seven centimeters, and they got either Votriant or a sugar pill that said Votriant on it. Uh, S-TRAC uh, used Sutent, same kind of uh, category as PROTECT, bigger tumors, um, generally with invasive features, 
and uh, got either Sutent or a sugar pill that said Sutent. And Atlas, which has only had a press release, it has not been published yet, so uh, we haven't seen the data sort of, you know, all of the granular details, but Atlas was using um, Exitinib or Enlita. And what was interesting about this one is uh, same kind of uh, patient population is protect, uh, but they could get uh, um, in light of for as short as a year, but for as long as three years. And they also um, included, uh, you know, in our country, uh, there's been a, a much higher proportion of, um, of white people participating in trials, not as many African Americans, not as many Asians. Um, Atlas included a lot of people from Asia, so it will give a lot of useful information both about duration of therapy, um, you know, whether longer than a year, or, um, and also just um, patients of, of different races. So this was the endpoints, and again, we show what we call a Kaplan-Meier curve. What you, what you really want to see here is that the, everybody's, everybody from each of these colors, whether it's Sutent, Serafinib, or Placebo, it's all one line. You don't really see much separation. So we really didn't see a benefit with this trial to these drugs for a year. Um, protect, there's a little bit of separation of the curve, but when you look at the statistics in the long run, uh, there was also not a benefit. Um, S-TRAC, when you looked at it, uh, there was a benefit, and the benefit was statistically significant. Um, and what they saw was that the disease-free survival um, improved by about a year. So if you took Sutent and you, uh, you, uh, your cancer took about a year longer to come back if you looked at the whole population. Um, and um, everybody was interested because the benefit, the curve seemed to be split a little bit longer. Uh, but look at this. This is the overall survival for each of these studies. And you can see that in each of these, uh, the curves are pretty flat. So it's not, in the long run, making a big difference in how long people are living uh, if they get adjuvant therapy. And, and that, that bothers us. Um, and uh, it bothered me a lot because, I mean, obviously I was very disappointed that the trial I ran didn't show a benefit after 2,000 patients participated. And, um, you know, this and one trial basically showed a benefit, and the other three trials, I should say, Atlas did not show a benefit um, in the press release. So we have three really large trials and one smaller that, that, that didn't show benefit, and one larger or smaller, rather, industry trial that did show a benefit. Um, so based on the S-TRAC data, uh, the FDA in this country did vote uh, to approve Sutent, and this is a, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network is a kind of a governing body that kind of gives advice about uh, how often to scan people, and you know what based uh, based on evidence, uh, you know what are the best treatments and stuff. So they did list um, adjuvant Sutent, but they listed it as a Category Two B, which means that. They considered some of the evidence to be lower level, basically because there were three trials that said no benefit and one trial that did show benefit. So it is available as a therapy, but I think um, there's a lot of us that still wonder, um, you know, what what should we do in this scenario? And the European Medicines Agency uh, actually voted not to approve. So different parts of the world feel differently about the trial results. So why did one trial show benefit, whereas the others did not? So at least because I could, I went back and looked at, uh, at the Assure trial. And we had had, uh, we had uh, well over 1,000 patients. I think it was, uh, um, uh, it was, it was close to uh, 1,500 patients that had just clear cell, didn't have non-clear cell. So this was already a, a pre-specified endpoint, and we looked, and, and you can see it's kind of interesting. While people are on treatment, you can see a little bit of separation of the curves, but then it really is still negative when, when you look at this population. And we went back and we looked at, we said, okay, we're going to look at just the group of patients that were entered on S-TRAC as far as stage and clear cell. And we still didn't see a difference in ours. 
And then we said, well, could it be the dose? You know, ours was the first trial that opened. People didn't have as much experience handling the side effects of the medicine. Could it be that? So we went back and looked at different dosing quartiles. So um, the people that got the full dose are quartile one. The people that got a lot of dose reductions or interruptions are quartile four. And quartile four is sort of, um, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of an outlier here, but the bottom line is when you look at all these dosing quartiles, the dose in our trial really did not explain why uh, our trial was a negative trial for sure. Um, so then uh, this is some data on the PROTECT trial, which is Votriant. And again, uh, I should say the ASSURED trial and the PROTECT trial both started out at full dose, and because so many patients had side effects and so many patients uh, dropped out, we lowered the starting dose in each of these to start at a slightly lower dose, and then if it was tolerable, people could go up on the dose. And so protected the same thing, and in that population, you can see that the people that managed to stay on the full dose, uh, there was a little bit of an improvement in disease-free survival. But if you looked at the whole group, I know the curves are split here a little bit, but statistically, um, it, uh, it did not show an overall benefit. Uh, but what's really interesting here is in the PROTECT trial, which is Votrian, the company actually did in... Um, in about uh, uh, several hundred people, I think it was about 200, 250, they actually did blood tests measuring drug levels. So they did it when they first started uh, early on, and they also did another one at eight weeks. So the early trough is about four to five weeks. The late trough is about eight weeks into the study. And you can see that if they had a higher, if they achieved a higher dose of Votrine in the bloodstream, they actually did benefit. But the thing that was really uh, complicated is that the drug level did not correspond to side effects, and it also didn't correspond to the dose. So it was really hard to predict. You know, there were people, these were mainly patients that, that had the 600 dosing, so uh, three pills instead of four pills. But it was very hard to determine if you took those three pills whether you're going to get a higher drug level or not. So it probably has something to do with the metabolism. And unfortunately, we don't really have assays to, uh, that are well developed to kind of use these and say, okay, I'm going to check a drug level and you, know, you should definitely stay on this drug. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's really a quandary because some people had really bad side effects and had high drug, drug levels. Other people had almost no side effects and had high drug, drug levels, or vice versa. So it's really a very complicated uh, story. And um, so, you know, this is basically what I'm trying to say. We went back, looked at our data. There was no difference even when you went and looked at the eligibility criteria similar to ASTRAC and in PROTECT. Uh, these drug levels did not correlate with dose or toxicity, but if you achieved a higher drug level, it did improve your uh, survival rate. But of course, um, we haven't looked at this with overall survival, so again, overall survival is, is important. And, and I think what's most troubling when we look at the VEGF inhibitors, using them as adjuvant therapy, is we really saw a lot of side effects. And so grade three means a pretty serious side effect, a side effect that means you need to stop drug or hold the drug and readjust the dose. It could be really severe diarrhea like six, seven times a day. It could be um, really hard to control blood pressure so that you had to have a whole bunch of drug uh, blood pressure medicines. It could be that you got a blood clot. It could be you know, a lot of different things, but it was something that involved a, a complicated medical Maneuver, And you can see that uh, over 56% of patients on all three of these trials had side effects. And one of the speculations is that because there isn't a lot of cancer sitting there, the drugs are going after your normal cells, not after your cancer. And so maybe some of that is why people are reporting more side effects. Or maybe it's also when you're an adjuvant population and your cancer is removed, you expect to feel better. Um, so these are side effects. I, I retooled a slide that Lauren Harshman kindly lent me, 
and I, because uh, we have a, a later one with immune therapy that I'll show you, but these are basically side effects that you can get with these drugs. Um, and this is a picture of uh, hand, foot, skin reactions, so you can get calluses in the feet or hands, sore feet, and you can get blisters that show up. Uh, so that was a, a troubling side effect on this trial. You can get mouth sores. Um, I would say my patients uh, probably complain the most about tiredness, taste changes, or unpredictable bowel movements as sort of the, the biggest things that really annoy them about these drugs. So uh, well, other reasons the studies could have been different, industry sponsor versus cooperative group, the area of the country they were looking at it, how, how, much, how frequent we were looking at scans, uh, when, you know, uh, how much help in managing the doses. There's, there's many things, and I'm not sure we're gonna, ever going to know, but uh, fortunately there's uh, a couple of other trials that have yet to report sources looking at one to three years of serafinib. We're expecting that uh, timizin is going to be able to prevent, present this data soon. The Everest trial is looking at an mTOR inhibitor, which is a Affinitor, and they did measure drug levels, so that, that should be interesting. And then this is a trial for patients who've had metastatic disease removed, asking if a year of Votriant versus placebo uh, could help prevent recurrence, and we think that the results of that will be available sometime next year. So what are my choices if uh, I have a kidney cancer about to be removed or just removed that's at risk for recurrence. Uh, there are four immune checkpoint inhibitor trials, which I'm going to talk about. There's adjuvant sutent, and importantly, surveillance is still a very good option for a lot of people. And we usually recommend uh, imaging every six months for the first three years and then yearly for two years, and then you stop with the imaging, but continue follow up with your primary care doctor or your oncologist just to, to look for symptoms. Uh, so what was really revolutionary two years ago was that nivolumab, or Optivo, as, as many of you will know from the television commercials, was tested in a trial in patients that had previously had uh, a VEGF TKI, such as Sutent or Votriant. And what they showed was, really importantly, they looked at overall survival, and they showed that uh, there was a, a big improvement in overall survival in patients that got Optivo over a Virolimus or Affinitor, which was a, a commonly used drug in this space. So that led to the FDA approval, and that, of course, led to uh, using these drugs earlier on. So how do these drugs uh, work? So this is another slide that, that Lauren lent me. And, and what, it, what it says is that uh, um, typically in cancer, uh, a T cell will sort of um, hijack viruses or bacteria, but what the immune checkpoint inhibitors do is they kind of rev up the immune system and they make the T lymphocytes uh, in your body uh, have a greater potential to recognize things that are foreign. And so instead of just recognizing viruses, they say, oh yeah, the cancer looks different from the normal cells, let's go after the cancer. And so these drugs are you know, widely available and approved now in lung cancer, kidney cancer, melanoma, um, uh, you know, the list goes on and on, hepatocellular carcinoma. They're, they're really being looked at in, in many different tumor types. And what I think what the patients love is that we're not seeing as much, the, the incidence of getting side effects appears to be much lower, and, and then you're seeing these survival benefits, not just disease-free survival. And this is another drug that, uh, that I mentioned because this is in some of the uh, trials and it has now been approved in combination with nivolumab. Ipilimumab, also known as Yervoy, uh, works in kind of a parallel pathway to um, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, and it can kind of um, heighten the response. Uh, it by itself, when it's used in kidney cancer, has not shown as much of a benefit, um, but it seems to um, increase the number of responses, at least uh, when it's used with nivolumab. 
the problem is that you can also get uh, a little bit more side effects with it. So these are four clinical trials that are open and enrolling, and I'm going to talk about each of these. This is the PROSPER trial, and what's really unique about PROSPER is that this is a trial that you would need to go on before your kidney cancer was removed. Um, the EMOTION trial, is, so this, is, this uses nivolumab, and uh, importantly, it's uh, the one arm patients get nivolumab, they get it before surgery for a couple weeks, and then they go on to get their cancer resected, and then they get another nine months of nivolumab. Um, if you're uh, assigned to get the no surgical treatment and not nivolumab, you don't have to be on a placebo. You can basically go straight to your surgery and then be monitored. Uh, so, so we really like the design of this trial, and we think the patients uh, like the design. The EMOTION trial is looking at atezolizumab versus it does have a placebo control. But what's nice about these three, the EMOTION, the Keynote, which is Keytruda or Pembrolizumab, and the Checkmate, which is Ipinevo or Yervoy and Optivo versus placebo, is that all of these are available to patients after their surgery if they have high-risk disease and are within three months of having their surgery. So PROSPER uh, allows patients who have any kind of kidney cancer. It doesn't have to be clear cell. Obviously, you're not going to know because uh, you have a scan showing it. Um, these, you have to have clear cell, but you also, this is also open to patients who if you had surgery and your kidney cancer comes back within a year and it's removable, you can still go on this trial. So it's available. All three of these are available uh, even if your cancer comes back within the next year and it's uh, resectable. So uh, digging down a little bit deeper, the PROSPERS trial has to have a biopsy up front. And there's a couple reasons for that, and that is mainly uh, we really want to make sure it's safe that, that you actually have cancer and that you have kidney cancer before you get treated. Now, the way this was set up initially is everybody had to have a biopsy. There's an amendment going through right now that what will happen is if you have a cancer that's seven centimeters or greater on your scans, you, you can then enter the trial, you can be randomized, and if you're randomized to the nivolumab, you still have to have the biopsy. But if you are randomized to just go to surgery alone, you don't have to have the biopsy because you're going to have a bigger biopsy when your cancer is removed. And this has also been modernized. Now that nivolumab or Optivo is available as a four-week dosing, uh, this has been changed so that you get one dose ahead of time. And this has been changed that uh, you can get uh, the nivolumab once a month. So that also cuts down on the time you have to go back and forth. And obviously, if you're on the observation arm, you get close follow-up scans, same as, the, as this arm. You're watched very closely, but you don't have to get a, a placebo. Um, and, and why would you want to get this beforehand? Well, the reason that, you might, that we think it might be important to get the drug before your kidney cancer is removed is the drug has to educate your lymphocytes about what to go after. So if you've already taken the kidney tumor out and you just have a little bit of cancer left over, then maybe there isn't enough to teach your lymphocytes to go after it. But if you give a couple of doses or one dose before you get the t kidney tumor out, then you're teaching all the cells to go after, hey, this is the bad guy, this is what we want to go after. So that was the rationale for giving a dose before surgery. Um, these are two of the other trials, the EMOTION trial, just to give you a little bit more detail. It's uh, atezolizumab on EMOTION is every three weeks for a year. And it's, it's clear cell. Um, and Keynote, uh, pretty similar desi uh, design, Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. I don't have a slide for the Ipi Nevo, but if we go back a couple slides, I think what's important here is you're getting these drugs, you're getting them every um, six weeks rather than three weeks, and you're getting them for six months, not a year. That's in, um, but you're getting uh, two drugs rather than one. And so what are the risks? So I think what we like about immune checkpoint inhibitors is they don't, they, by and far, most people don't have side effects. Um, but if you get a side effect, it can be pretty scary. So you can get 
some pretty wild autoimmune effects. It can affect the pituitary gland, which can affect a whole bunch of things like your adrenal gland, your thyroid gland, or you could also get um, some very you know, unusual side effects like uh, making liver inflammation, making the pancreas uh, inflamed, getting diabetes. Um, I would say by and far the most common side effects are rash and tiredness. That's about 15% of the population. So still, it's 15% versus a 60% getting side effects. So I'm going to end here, but basically just say my conclusions are the US use of the VEGF drugs in the adjuvant set setting still is controversial since it's not showing an overall survival benefit. But uh, the disease-free survival benefit did, for Estrac did lead to the approval of adjuvant sutent. And uh, you just have to keep in mind that uh, there were a lot of side effects in, in patients on this, and so it's not for everybody. Maybe we will get some more details about who will benefit. Um, importantly, we have these new trials with these immune checkpoint drugs, which we hope will inform us about uh, their role, and we hope that they will lead to benefit, but it remains to be tested. And uh, if you know anybody that hasn't had their kidney cancer surgery yet, uh, the PROSPER trial is, uh, is really a good option as well. And the bottom line, your choices are these four clinical trials, adjuvant sutent or close surveillance. So happy to entertain any questions.